Hey, you. Finally awake. For a near 12 year old game, Skyrim lets you do so much. With a little help from modding, we can achieve such diverse playstyles that it's no wonder people continue to play the game to this day. So imagine my surprise when I learned that with modding, I could play Skyrim by importing some moldy old save game data from my previous playthroughs into one save. Seeing the gang back together is going to be something else. And we're just happy to be here. The rules for this playthrough are simple. Sir Chad Blobblebubbany MBE will not get any kills, because that wouldn't be very wholesome. We'll be playing on legendary difficulty with the win condition being the defeat of Alduin. My companions must loot all of their own gear, with me only being allowed to arrange the gear, not give them new gear. After all, the most Chad thing we can possibly do is enable our friends in the gang to realize what they're truly capable of and thusly reach their true potential. It's for this reason I have named this the Sigma Male Challenge. I've escaped Helgen and arrived in Riverwood, where it's now not such a bad time to introduce the gang. We have Professor Blobblestein. Need something? He's a man out of time. A child if the child were a grown man. A war hero, having led the Stormcloak army across Skyrim with his highly specialized SEAL Team Kindergarten. Dr. Norbzine, PhD. Finally, someone useful is around. Basically, nothing nefarious going on here. He's just he's just Nazim after redoing his vows with Arlen. A rather accomplished fellow, if I don't say so myself. He's turned over a new leaf, and he's kind of a nice guy now. I guess you could say. The old Nazim is gone. Glob Unga Bunga. He kinda just looks around. He suffers from a rare condition called ataxia, so there'll be times you look him in the eyes and what looks back at you is, is absolutely nothing. He makes funny noises too. It's it's all it's all very tragic, really. Snorbin Blorbin, a rather sly fellow. Out in a crowd he's not much of a force, but in the shadows he becomes a phantom. A dealer of death. Then there's many, many cobble bubners. Well, hello. On the surface, he is simply a senile old man past his sell-by date. But beneath all that lies the dragonborn of legend. In his own universe, he destroyed Alduin in one punch. This is the one we have to look out for in his challenge. Doubling up as a test and loot run, we head on out to Embershard Mine. Show me. Then that is my task. Now ain't this a surprise. Oh! Where we see many many Marborbin doesn't actually contribute to combat. Seemingly neither does Norbzim or Snorbenblorbin, who I suspect only knows spells that require too much mana for his level. It's a little crowded in here, but it's never not entertaining. You're no match for me. You'll need to do better than that. And all the boys are picking up the gear that they are now equipping, so that suits me. This also sets a good benchmark for where we are right now as a group of like-minded and highly skilled individuals trying to make a way through a run set to the highest difficulty in Skyrim. Overall a good run, it's easy now at level 1, but as I inevitably level up doing things I probably will not need to do, the enemies will scale and this will end up becoming more difficult. But at this time, no changes are needed. We need only the gang. Watch it! And we, the gang, follow our dreams. We stop by Anissa's cabin and make our way up to the mountain to Bleak Falls Barrow, where we'll need to go to pick up the Dragonstone Tablet and progress the main story quest. Glob has a pickaxe, which is really helpful because he assists with mining raw materials, like the brain from this bandit's cranium. Anyway, we're not supposed to know about the Dragonstone Tablet just yet, but we are universe-hopping, otherworldly beings accompanied by a very muscular man-child. And simply knowing that we don't know the things we know is a path to knowing things again for the first time again, maybe. As a matter of fact, knowing about unknowns before they are known, and knowing about unknowns that you don't know are completely different scenarios. If you know about unknowns before they are known, you might be inquisitive. And if you know about unknowns you don't know, you're... you're tele telepathic. This group possesses neither of these traits. <laughs> a fun observation is that Norbzim will sometimes take part in combat, and other times in the same play session and the same dungeon, will ignore conflict entirely, instead allowing Manny to tank some hits, and watch on as our big man with the taxia destroys our enemies. We clear the final chamber, grab the Dragonstone, return to Riverwood, hand the claw to Lucan, who refuses to look us in the eye, instead opting for a post-Vietnam thousand yard stare. We pet his domesticated rabbits and place a basket on his head, and take all of his stuff. I start to celebrate, and this is this is where I notice something strange. Professor Blobblestein isn't here anymore. Manny is cooking, Snorbin Blobin is sneezing, Norbzim is, is being shady, and Glob is destroying Lucan Valerius's kitchen furniture. It's at this point that I start to backtrack, and instead of going through all of Bleak Falls Barrow and its undead crypts to see where we, the adults, left our young professor unattended, I methodically Skyrim jump up the mountain to the ruins hidden exit. I discover Professor Blobblestein just standing in the final chamber where we looted the Dragonstone tablet. Just, just standing there for hours. 
at that robe. Are you a wizard? Bye. And anyway, he's okay, so I tell him to come along and think nothing of it. But he's not okay. And by thinking nothing of it, I was ignoring the signs. I started to notice changes. That ends it. I'm out and about in Whiterun, continuing the quest, reminiscing with my old friend Heimsker, who tells me I have come. You have come. You have come to- But obviously I haven't, because Sir Chad Borpal Bobby practices semen retention for maximum gains in the gym. Gains so powerful it makes the woman fawn over him. Huh? Thereafter, immediately dematerializing so that their lustful essences return to the void, where all succubi must go. But I digress. I'm concerned right now for our little professor, who's been saying things I don't think he means. I don't converse with my prey. In a voice I didn't set him in the Proteus mod. But again, I think nothing of it, because Skyrim is full of all sorts of oddities strapped together to keep it functional, and this mod might not be any different. We travel to the guard tower and dispatch the dragon there, absorb its soul, and make a detour to Riften in order to collect a very, very important spell that will allow us to to never get caught in a doorway behind five companions ever again. Telekinesis. I very much doubt we can sneak over to the telekinesis spell tome as Sir Chatters, because years in the squat rack have caused his perfectly chiseled glutes to become dummy thick, and a clap of his ass cheeks will surely alert the guards. So we switch to someone we know is proficient at sneaking and who lacks the thickness. With the telekinesis spell gained, I can shove my companions at will and we're prepared for the next leg of the journey. But first I'm interrupted in my conversation with this creepy person here by Glorb's crotch, who hands me a letter. I'd actually forgotten all about this small DLC with one of the multitude of patches the game received over the years, but this presents us a golden opportunity to future-proof some of our companions for when the game starts to scale unfavorably. You see, the letter contains specific constructions for something-something beggar at the docks in Windhelm. I'm given the option to donate different amounts, I instead pray for his prosperity. Because man such as Chadley Kuberbop's prayers are, in, are immense indeed. He then travelled to the shrine nearby where Lyra, the warrior who handed the letter to Glob's crotch, will be waiting for you. She will then frighten Glob away and electrocute you to death. So you reload and watch on as Dr. Nobzine pretty huge doctorate right hooks her to death. This is desirable because we then allow our companions to strip her still warm corpse bare and rearrange all the gear so that now Glob is our ebony god. He's still wearing Vittorio Vici's flower headdress though because he is Vittorio Vici. He is speed. It's a magnificent day to be climbing up the steps to High Hrothgar. A day for progress. A day for giving. Snorbin Blobin lends a hand to the locals with their cabbage patch. The gift of charity is truly inspiring. Manny is an old man and having pathing problems, so our charity to him is to assist him with climbing up the mountain. We make the journey up the 7,000 steps, which I think are more like a hundred, but we do this as companions, arm in arm, a group of like-minded individuals. We dispose of a dragon, Snorbin Blobin paralyzes a troll, and everyone stands around it, appreciating the moment, relishing in our good company. You're gonna pay! We reach the summit and play bowling with arm gear in an attempt to, s to speed up the dialogue. It's working. Master Einarth grants us his understanding of Ro. We head outside for the next lesson. We learn Whirlwind Sprint, converse with the Greybeards. But this is only one word of power in the Whirlwind Sprint tree of skills. And if we want to conquer long distances in the fashion we do, then we will have to have the remaining two words in Volsgiga and Dead Men's Respite. This is very important, you're just gonna have to trust me. So we travel across the land, searching far and wide, through each drug or tomb to understand the power that's inside and watch Snorbin Blobbin cycle through his ammunition and not help at all. My favorite part about all this is how the enemies insist on targeting the frail old man who is absolutely no threat to them. With the three words of power for Whirlwind Sprint unlocked, we will now make our way over to Solstheim via boat. But on the way there, we will stop over at Tumble Arch Pass for an important item that you, the player, are unable to interact with or pick up. But if we now command Glob and have him pick up the giant's club, we have an unstoppable giant killing machine in Glob, wielding the weapon with the highest base stats in the game, and unleash him on the fauna in Solstein, from which we will tear an alchemy ingredient called Netch Jelly from these things' cold, dead hands, 
Tentacles? Ha hands. We do this until we have 34 of them, which should be just enough to accomplish what we have set out to accomplish on this great and wondrous journey. With our preparations finished, we make our way through Ustengrav to get the horn of Jürgen Windcaller, trying our best to quell our concern for Professor Blobblestein, who is now muttering about killing out of the blue. Blood, whenever you want it. Between bouts of our boys paralyzing, waiting, and then pulverizing our enemies. Big surprise, we get to the end of the dungeon and the horn has been replaced with a note by Delphine. She's so helpful. I return to Riverwood to speak with her, assist Glorb in entering her weird basement dungeon, agree to help her investigating the dragons, and then kindly fold her onto her shelves before we head out. I arrive in Carthwaston and we make our final preparations to fight the second dragon boss in the game. You and me, we're the only people around who aren't complete fools. The fight is an absolute breeze, and could have been done single-handedly by Glob with his giant hammer. I consider renaming him to Blobenheimer because he has become death, destroyer of worlds. And there's absolutely nothing I cannot do so long as he is present. Delphine awards us with the next part of the main quest. Exploring themes of racism. We send her back to Riverwood where she wants us to meet her. But Professor Blobblestein makes comments about prey hunting while we absorb the power of the three wise men. Then and only then do we continue our quest across the land to meet up with Queen Racism back in Riverwood. You see, we start off by shouting a full power whirlwind in the direction of Riverwood, which is directly below us. And then midair we have to rub Netch Jelly on our nipples. The Netch Jelly paralyzes you on application and is also really good for hypertrophy and muscle growth. Observe. We are now in Riverwood. You gotta be careful with this application though. Very, very careful. Things can go wrong. We help Belle Delphine down the stairs into her OnlyFans basement, skip as much dialogue as I can, and watch our companions warp in and out of reality at will. I agree to find Melbourne and kindly fold her onto her shelves before we head out. I conscientiously request that my companions move out of the way so that I may leave the domicile of Dolphine and rocket blast my meat mountain of a body across the world over to Whiterun. Everything is going as smooth as smooth goes. I let an elf undress me in the pub, suffer Dolphine's comments about my attire. You can't go to a party at the Thalmor Embassy dressed like that. But despite this being one of the most irritating parts of the main questline, somewhere deep down inside, you can't go to a party at the Thalmor Embassy. Beneath all of this genetic perfection, behind these twice daily brushed teeth, these eyes that stare joyously at the horizon, you can't go to a party at the Thalmor Embassy. Somewhere beneath these inches upon inches of natural free-range chest press dumbbell fly woven muscle fiber gown of perfection, you can't go to a party at the Thalmor Embassy. We know, we know we're going to enjoy this party. And you are. Please, Madam, tell me about yourself. As soon as you distract the guards, I'll open this door. I beg your pardon? The mission is a massive success. The Thalmor are completely innocent at Delphine's accusations, meaning we killed dozens of them for sport and racism. This this whole quest is meaningless. She sends us to find Esburn in the Riften Ratway. We kindly fold her onto her shelves before we head out. We head over to Riften. Brynjolf is hostile to us for some reason, so I leave the gang behind to fight him in the streets, and we crawl into the sewers to find Esburn. He doesn't trust anyone, but we convince him we're harmless. He then spends about a minute undoing all the locks on his door, and then we immediately throw him out, lock the door behind us, and start to steal all of his stuff. Anyway, we agree to take him back to Delphine, run past the Thalmor we have absolutely no hope of beating without Glorb and Blob, arrive back in Riften only for Delphine to lose it at us because Esburn hasn't made it here yet. What? You left him on his own? <sighs> so we return to the right way, this time with the gang. 
And we find our old buddy Esburn having a full geriatric meltdown in his house. Where he summons a flame atronarch to help him defeat a flame atronarch. An enemy notoriously immune to fire damage. Glorb and some random homeless NPC fight off the atronarch. I fast travel back to Riverwood. Give the old man a helping hand down the stairs into Delphine's basement. Where I skip as much dialogue as humanly possible because I have done this dozens of times and I feel like if I keep this up, pieces of me will continue to die and the voices, god the voices will grow stronger. Do you know what he's talking about? I fast travel to Markarth via carriage, and then fast travel to Skyhaven where I'll meet Delphine and Esburn. There's a massive dangerous camp of Forsworn here, but a quick and easy strategy is to simply apply some niche jelly to the areola, and avoid combat entirely while your entourage of highly skilled companions all deal with the threat without you. The boys easily dispatch the remainder inside the cave, and by the boys I mean Glorb who was just way overpowered with the giant hammer. The puzzle portion of the cave is very not good because we have companions with us that like to walk all on in there, smothering themselves all over the pressure plates. So we've come up with a very special strategy to cross safely. You see, the trap can't blow us all up if it's already shooting at someone. So I simply throw Manny Manny Morbin Bourbon into the trap and sprint across to safety. Please comment. Be careful, many, many bobber nubney. We'll cross once it's safe. I've been told that YouTube recommends content with engagement, so if you can do this for me, I'd appreciate it more than Sir, Sir Chadding Tatum, MBE, appreciated the bull shark testosterone he injects into his bum before every workout. Genius plays. The seal into Skyhaven Temple requires essence of masculinity, so we provide this. And enter the Great Hall. We stand at Alduin's wall for ages to complete this stage of the quest, but it's clear Delphpeen and Esburn are stuck in the hallway. So we give them a helping hand and bring them out. It's all just about spreading that wholesome energy, you see. You of the brethren will strike out on our own. <laughs> <laughs> we skip as much dialogue as possible. Are you paying attention, Delphine? Return to Arngear to ask him about a shout to defeat Alduin. He teaches us the Clear Sky shout and grants us his power so that we can go and meet Parthenax up the mountain. He then grants us his knowledge of the shout while we hold him over an open flame. And just as things are going as I expect them to, I open my menu to equip Clear Skies and I notice that I've contracted a taxier somewhere. Now, I went through some of the old footage and I can't exactly find where I caught this, but I suspect it's uh, in a drug or tomb somewhere. And then my curiosity got the better of me and I started to Google search what it does. Apparently it exists in real life and can come from a brain injury. We've, we've had a few of those so far. Also from injecting growth hormone directly into the brainstem. So I feel like it's starting to explain a lot. Old buddy Parthenax Dragon sends us to go and find an Elder Scroll so we can learn the Dragon Wren shout. Fortunately for us, we already know where to find one because we've played the game before. We have to go directly north of this mountain. We fast travel north until we get to this ice cave relieve Septimus Cygnus of this, like, cube thing, and take it to Alftan by traveling through the snowy region as fast as we can. The boys paralyze a nutty cat man in the ruins and proceed to beat him to death. Somewhere along the way, we lose Glorb, and a couple skirmishes in, it becomes apparent that he is really the beating heart of this whole playthrough. He is the only thing stopping us from being completely obliterated. I'm an incredibly slow man and get destroyed by this trap. I watch on as my companions too get destroyed by this trap. But why don't they simply apply some niche jelly to the nipples and bypass the trap altogether? Are they stupid? I apply this logic to some of the remaining levels of the dungeon so that I don't have to navigate my way down like some kind of soy normie. But I get shot in the ass by a poison arrow and perish shortly thereafter. Now, now I'm not a quitter, so I give this another go. But unfortunately, this soggy looking guy asks me for a vape and, and my soul leaves my body. Looks like it's going to be the long way through the dungeon for me. <laughs>
These playthroughs always get funky fresh in Blackreach. So we communicate in code to the boys to let them know we're going to fight a dragon. Glob kicks the shit out of the dragon. Yeah, yeah, I know, plot twist. We progress to the final chamber, where just like the rest of you, we spam these buttons and pretend we know the mechanics of the puzzle to unlock the Elder Scroll. We hop on down to grab the Elder Scroll, and return to the Throat of the World, where we read it to learn Dragonrend. To the time wound. Oh. We watch the Boomer Dragonborns fight Alduin in the past, and then there's this weird moment where one of them gets bitten so hard that they get duplicated and die twice. That- that's wild. <laughs> Suddenly Alduin, we cast Dragonrend as our only contribution. Snorb and Blorben insist that we bathe in Alduin's blood, and Glorb says he's fought worse than Alduin. Which is funny because Alduin is the literal world eater, firstborn of Akatosh, god of time, and harbinger of the apocalypse. But to be fair to Glorb, he may, he may be like me and have some really vivid fever dreams where he fights his dad, who may also have a giant's club. With Alduin effortlessly banished from this mortal realm by our big hammer man, we shoot off towards Whiterun to convince Jarl Balgruff to let us use his house to capture a dragon. Our persuasion attempts are not good. He won't let us use his house to save the world until we have single-handedly ended the civil war. We gently wake up Arngear and ask if we can use his house to end the war, so we can then use Balgraf's house to catch the dragon. And he agrees. I speak to Ulfric, who is relieved the Greybeers have turned their gaze. It's about time they turned their gaze. This is a shocking revelation. But at least he agrees to come to the peace meeting, I guess. Tullius also agrees, so we grab many, many Borbuldorp and make our way to High Hrothgar. We arrive safe and sound and are assigned the mediator for negotiations between the two sides. Delphine's trying to invite herself in for some reason, as if she's contributed anything to the quest whatsoever other than obstructing our search for the Horn of Jürgen Windcaller and accusing the Thalmor of being responsible for the apocalypse because they're elves. Ulfric says some things loudly within earshot of everyone at the negotiation table. Thou more bitch. And as a wise and responsible mediator, we just agree with him. This is all going really smoothly considering Professor Blobblestein, this, this little goblin thing, is muttering in the corner about striking out at everyone. I've never done this before, but I actually accidentally keep both sides of the meeting completely happy by guessing my way through the conversation like the Master Chad man I am. Delphine then repeatedly tries to get my attention to tell me to kill old mate Parthenax for no reason other than that he is a dragon because a dragon isn't a white person. But here's a tip, if you simply ignore her and then send her down the mountain, she never gets the opportunity to speak and you, you never get the quest. Problem solved. <laughs> We speak to Balgruff, who lets us use his house to capture a dragon, while his staff and children are still present within it. Now, there's a city guard here who's scripted to be killed by Odaving once you summon him. I try my best to nudge the guard out of the way to save him, but Odaving simply uses wall hacks to get to him anyway. He also gets Professor Blobblestein, but Professor Blobblestein is too, too cursed to die. It's an excellent battle, with long periods of Odaving staring into Snorbin Blobbin's eyes. It's, it's really a wild time. It gets to a point where I'm supposed to catch him, but I'm unable to lure him into the trap further into the fort, so I start to pull my companions away with telekinesis. It becomes apparent that my companions are too bloodthirsty, so I simply leave, and then force Jarl Balgruff and his guards to fight a dragon for an hour before I re-enter and catch Odaving. The hours and hours of being clubbed to death now mean Odaving gives off a mad swiggity swooty vibe, and I'm not sure his legs will ever be the same again. He gets hella uncomfortably close, and waddles his way to the other side of the fort. Our attacks here intensifies. We make it to the next part of the journey, the final gauntlet of the trials before Alduin. Our boys absolutely dominate the dragons here. The power that Glorbs commands is absolutely unreal. I've never seen such domination before. Snorb and Blorben is paralyzing the undead and making a joke out of them. And I'm just sitting here full on focusing on the Draga puzzles while they're engaged in combat. They're, they're even flexing on their enemies. They bash them to within an inch of their life and then watch them while they're paralyzed on the floor for like 8 seconds while they're down. It's like they know this is a game. I see these Draga through a window that I can't get through, but I know someone small enough who can. There was a door here this whole time. <laughs> I mean, let's see if... Yeah, yeah, Glob doesn't fit. Anyway, it was a fun little experiment. The final enemy in here is a Drugger Overlord. They're really threatening. <laughs> the Dragon Priest shoots lightning at this wall and then gets crushed by Glob. It's like poetry in motion. We make it through the portal to Sovereign Guard. Afterlife to only the most heroic Nords. We fall over. <laughs> this is a very dangerous place, but in the distance I can see the Great Hall, so we go full send, slam into this tree and fall to our deaths. 
This results in a mad autosave death loop from which there's no escape. I cannot believe it. We've made it this far. I load a previous save and cheat my way across the bridge without challenging the bouncer out front. And Todd Howard personally emails my PC to execute death commands on Sir Chad Norb PhD before we can enter. So I watch Norbzim personally box the man and Glorb crush him. And we gain entry. This face stirs up the legendary heroes of old because, because of course it does. Now I wish I could sit here and tell you I wasn't sure how this would end. But while the boys are crushing it, I was running around legitimately fighting for my life. The cosmological horrors Alduin unleashed on the gang I will never bear witness to again. It was truly a harrowing experience. But victory is inevitable. We are returned to the throat of the world, where the other dragons bear witness to our victory and their servitude to Alduin is undone. Our quest is finished. It was a long run, and it sometimes with Glob certainly felt like a sprint, other times a walk. But the boys get it done. And as suddenly as they are thrust into our universe, we bid them farewell, and they must journey back to theirs. You need my strength again? I'll be home. Sir Chad Bungledorp Mibi can do nothing but watch on as they return home. For they walk a different path. And by different path, of course, we mean different save games entirely. Was it much of a challenge? Of course not. But there's something to be said about going out there and having fun instead of finding reasons to do something again. Of course Skyrim was going to be beaten by a gang of like five people. In reality, the moment Glob equipped the giant's hammer, the challenge was over. It had been decided. The man is a god. You'd have to be completely brain dead to think otherwise. And speaking of brain dead, Sir Chadley Dinkle Flinkle Dorpen Bibble Snatch MBE has one more thing that needs to be done. You look rather pale. Could be ataxia. We all gonna make it, bruh. A huge thank you to the patrons. If it weren't for you, I'd be dead face down in a ditch covered in, in feces. <laughs> You're my equivalent of Glob's giant hammer, so thank you very much. And for everyone else, if you haven't commented uh, the thing I said earlier, comment, uh, just make a comment, please. It helps me so much. Good lord. I love you all.